Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, today we want to have a look at a distribution that's not quite Linux, but it is a close family member, and that is BSD. We're going to look at Ghost BSD. This was the request of a supporter uh, who asked me to have a brief look at it, and uh, I thought, yeah, let's go ahead and give it a brief try. Now, before we get started here, first and foremost, BSD is similar to Linux, but it does have some differences. So this is outside of my area of regular use and expertise. I do use a little bit of BSD in my PFSense router is based on BSD, uh, free BSD. And so I'm not a complete noob at it, but for most practical purposes, the only time I have to jump in there is if I have a problem, which is actually almost never. That PFSense router is solid, minus a few little issues that were problems that occurred when I started being in the van because I was turning it off. And we'll just say that the, um, the backup battery is not working uh, at this point in time for whatever reason and um, keeping it, I just keep it powered on all the time since there's no moving parts anyway. Uh, but outside of that, BSD has treated me well. There are some similar developments with Linux and there are some differences. Before we go ahead and get into the uh, the gist of Ghost BSD, let's talk briefly about BSD and Linux and uh, where these came from and the diversion portions. So, uh, First, we have to understand going all the way back to Unix, which I think was AT&T. Um, so Unix is created, and then there's a series of software packages, and one of those became known as the uh, the BSD system, which was the, the Berkeley uh, Standard Development, I believe it was called, is what BSD would stand for. And then it kept itself going for a period of time. And then there was a licensing dispute. It's in the middle of that licensing dispute that the BSD code base uh, really slowed development quite a bit because nobody was quite sure of the future. It is that lawsuit that slowed down BSD, which caused the birth of the Linux kernel, which is also based on Unix. So BSD and Unix both come uh, excuse me, BSD and Linux both come from the same core of Unix. And of course, Unix is used as a base for like Mac OS. Actually, technically, it is BSD that is used as the base for Mac OS. And when the BSD stopped being developed, which I think was 1995, don't quote me on that, the development of FreeBSD, Dragonfly BSD, and a few other BSDs based on the original Berkeley BSD uh, have come out. <clears throat> and since then, now we have a FreeBSD branch. Now, Ghost BSD is designed to be a BSD, uh, FreeBSD base that is easier to work with because FreeBSD is more difficult to work with than Linux, even on the terminal level. Uh, here in Linux, we've had a lot of development that, you know, Pac-Man or Apt or EO Package or DNF, whichever one you're using for your package manager, does a really good job of sorting out and filtering out the dependencies and things like that. It would appear that the package management in BSD does not do quite as well with that. Uh, that's my understanding flipping through. And you have to please understand that I have not had hours and hours to dig into it, but I did want to do a little bit of a background framework to understand by which we are going to do this. So what GhostBSD does is they have provided a few tools, one of those being an updater tool and one of those being a software manager tool that will take care of all those things and they are GUI. Now that's not to say they are perfect and uh, most likely we're going to run into a few of the issues that I've seen today. Uh, this is the second take I'm doing of this video because the first video was horrible and I do not want to release horrible on the world for the sake of doing a video. Hence, we're doing the video today instead of yesterday. So I hope to get you a much better video here using this. But let's go ahead and look first and foremost about a few things. Uh, FreeBSD, the first question I really had is, what type of software do you have available? Well, BSD can handle pretty much any type of software there is. It can be compiled because it's based on a Unix workstation system. Pretty much any software that somebody would like to get working for uh, FreeBSD, it can be in there. And I looked at a few different software packages I might use, and eh, pretty much everything I looked at was there in some level. Maybe we'll dig a little 
little bit deeper today just to see if we can find a few more. However, I we will see that there are a few little issues with it. So it is a little bit more difficult. And my recommendation is if you want to jump into BSD, just like if you want to jump into Linux, you do need to take a little bit of time to spend some time learning more about it. Uh, in me, I, I spent the last couple days just reading up some stuff on BSD and FreeBSD and GhostBSD just to understand what's going on. But here it just kind of talks about, you know, the internet services. It uses X. Uh, I didn't notice if Wayland is in there or not. We have XSCE, LXDE, KDE in the GNOME desktop environments. We have LibreOffice, uh, Thunderbird. Evolution comes default on GhostBSD. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different stuff that is available. So pretty much any of the type of FOSS software we have in Linux, most likely you're going to find it on BSD. Now, based on my experience with PFSense, the one thing that I found BSD is not really good at is managing Wi-Fi cards. So it works, but it doesn't work well. For example, my PFSense router, I have an external wireless card, I can set it to run B, I can set it to run G, I can set it to run N, I can't set it to run all of them. So I have to make a decision how to set my wireless chip in my router because it's based on BSD and the computer connecting to it might have a limitation. And that is certainly one of the challenges that I have encountered. This is why, so I'm not sure if they have yet fixed this, but a lot of people who, who have used PFSense over the years usually have attached some extra form of external wireless adapter. Like you could buy just an external AC node or uh, something like that, which would be used to expand your network in that case, something that you attach with the LAN. Uh, but that is one of the few limitations I've encountered. I don't know if there's been a lot of work on that in the last couple of years since I've looked into it. But that's pretty much my extent of knowledge of BSD. Now I wanted to jump into Ghost BSD. So Ghost BSD, as they, as I already mentioned here, it's really designed to make BSD a much more user friendly, if you will. It's like the Linux Mint of the BSD world. It's going to allow you to get your feet wet to get a working system without having to worry about a lot of the under hood stuff stuff and uh, you can take the time to learn the underhood stuff later. So it's a simple, elegant, friendly BSD operating system for desktops and laptops based on free BSD. Ghost BSD is a slow rolling release. While some GNU Linux distributions are on the bleeding edge side, we tried to offer a stable update and release cycle. The official desktop environment is Mate, and uh, there uh, the system comes with a graphical application to install the software and update your system. Most codecs to play multimedia files are pre-installed. The installer leverages OpenZFS, makes it easy to install Ghost BSD on ZFS and with other OS on the same drive. It is suitable for newcomers to FreeBSD with modest hardware requirements. GhostBSD is ideal for modern workstations and 64-bit single board computer hardware. So um, you can run it on a Pi, I guess, is what I'm hearing there. Head on over to the download link. We have our GhostBSD. Uh, there is a community build, which is XFCE. So that is also available. And uh, I don't know where the ARM builds would be. Um, they might be here somewhere. Now, I did uh, want to look at the GhostBSD. What's the name of this? Uh, uh, why is it called GhostBSD? So it was developed as an operating system to hack GNOME using FreeBSD technology. After a while, it became what referred to as the GNOME hosted by FreeBSD, which means that GNOME is hosted on the FreeBSD system. Today, GhostBSD's name is still relevant in the past since Mate is a continuation of GNOME 2. So if you're saying, well, why is it GhostBSD with running Mate? Well, that's the reason. Uh, they didn't like the direction of GNOME 3. So like a few other systems, they stuck with Mate, which is a variation of GNOME 2. And what do they mean by hacked on? I, my guess is um, that what they're meaning is they wanted to implement GNOME inside of BSD, basically making BSD easier to manage with the desktop operating system. GNOME. That's what my I get out of that. So you can read more about the software over there.
Now, as far as the installation of this was concerned, um, it was not any more difficult. Now, I set it up in a virtual box. I was running into a few errors, mostly display errors and a few update errors. So I went ahead and dropped it over into GNOME boxes to see if I had any better luck over there. Then there was a slight difference in the install, in which case it wanted me to manually select uh, what type of video drivers. So since I'm using a, um, I have an AMD graphics card, I just went ahead and selected the the uh, AMD chipset inside of the installer, and the installer was fairly simple. I think we're probably not going to uh, run through the installer, or I don't know, maybe I'll just put some uh, some overlay installation over here if I didn't completely delete the files yet. Like I said, I did not like the stuff, uh, the videos I did the other day, but uh, uh, maybe I'll uh, pull those out just to look at the, the installation. Fairly simple. If you've installed a Linux distribution, you're not going to have any real issues. Now, where we're going to uh, jump in here is let's go ahead and look at our. Um, we're going to go ahead and look at our um, uh, our booting up with our VirtualBox, and there we are. So here is our Ghost BSD, and this is pretty much exactly the type of menu I expect. My PS Sense looks pretty much exactly like this. And what we're going to do now is let's go ahead and full screen this here. For whatever reason, the top bar is not disappearing on GhostBSD. I have no idea why. So forgive the top bar being there. The other thing that I have noticed is, for whatever reason, it's not actually detecting my display settings properly. So uh, it does look full screen, but it is actually a little bit warped um, just because of the display settings. So uh, that is, of course, a virtualization environment. So there are limitations, particularly with your display settings in virtualization. We're going to go ahead and forgive that, but let me just go ahead and walk you through briefly uh, looking at the uh, the displays here so up here if we go on over to our hardware you can see it's locking the resolution at 1280 by 720 and I really I can't go any higher of course this is going to um, uh, distort the screen size so I don't want to do that um, so yeah that's kind of what we get over here um, so the screen size is not ideal, but that's okay. We can go ahead and deal with it. So of course, what I get, what I'm looking at here is just a basic Mate screen. We have our, you know, our just our desktop and uh, or a basically our panel and our desktop displays is down here on the bottom. We have a top panel with our date and our application menus. So over here we have some software, and you can see here just. The basic software you would expect. We have passwords, we have Plank, Pluma, screenshot tools, anything you'd find on side of any Linux distribution. So if you were a computer ignoramus and you didn't know what this was, you might not know that this is BSD instead of Linux, instead of, well, something else, depending, of course, you'd want to know what one of those is. And I guess that's well, not necessarily fair because if you know that it's a, uh, uh, if you know what Linux is, you know that this is probably BSD. I don't know. Uh, maybe you wouldn't. Who knows? So if we get rid of the, the G branding up at the top and you didn't look at the system settings, you know, that's probably the case. Here we have our basic tools. And I want to show you just a couple things about Ghost that make this specifically unique. It's we have the software station and the update station. We also have a backup station so we can manage your boot environments and things. Now, here is where I ran into the problem with this. And maybe you can let me know about this. I have a few possible hypotheses about what's going on. But the updates in the system are stalling out. Um, and I haven't gotten any resolution as to what the problem actually is. I have no earthly idea. Um, now, it could be related to maybe it doesn't want to run the updates on a... Uh, on a cellular network system because you know, I'm running this system on, you know, my entire van internet is a cellular system. However, if that is really the problem, uh, I think what we need to do is we probably need to get to the point where we can get that resolved because out here in the country where I'm actually recording this from, I get good signal on a cell connection but there is no house out here that can get good signal with some form of wired connection. So that's one hypothesis I have. Um, but other than that, I, uh, I don't really know. So what you're seeing here is it does look like it's going to work. The challenge that I was encountering is every single time I tried to run the updates like this, it would get to a certain update number and it was kind of random and it would just simply stop. 
and I'd see no display screen. There's nothing else on this screen here. And basically what would happen is it would simply stop. It looks like it's frozen. Give it five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes even. The thing doesn't go anywhere. And so what would end up happening is I would need to let the guy install and then it would stop. I'd have to shut it down. And then if I tried to run the update in the terminal instead, I'd get to effectively that same package and it would just say stalled in the terminal. And then eventually after about five or so minutes, it would fail out entirely and I couldn't run the updates again without rebooting the system. So there is something going on in the updates. In fact, it almost looks like uh, 28 might be one of those frozen updates. I don't know. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this go and uh, see if this actually proceeds on. So we'll note the time. It is uh, 17.58 on the system clock. I'm going to let this guy go for a little bit, and we will see if this expands and updates any further than this. Hey, so here we are about 10 minutes later, and it simply fails. So hit detail to get the help here. So here is the repository catalog. Catalog is up to date. Checking for candidates, packages to be installed. And here it's downloading the stuff. So all this is the type of stuff you'd see. In fact, this is almost exactly the type of stuff that you'd see looking at a, a log of Pac-Man, for example, which I've had to do many times from uh, having to revert a few packages in Arch. So you can see that it's fetching, uh, fetch 62 of 180. And this is actually the same package that was failing out on, uh, on the yesterday. Now, in Pac-Man, for example, and this is one of those things where Linux has solved a little bit better. In Pac-Man, if a package fails, it skips it and it updates everything around it. And sometimes it just means that, uh, in this case, it says missing or size mismatch. This means that the repository is what it's reporting is a different thing from what is actually downloaded. And so this, instead of updating around that broken package, this just aborts the whole update. So I'm not getting any updates. And this is the exact experience that I was having uh, before. Now, on this type of system, what we can do, let's go ahead and close this. What we can do is we can run these in updates. However, if you check the update log uh, or the, um, the, the update information, the FAQs, the the how to use the system, then um, it does actually tell you, hey, you should be updating this using the GUI tools. It doesn't actually want you to upgrade it using the um, using the package or the, the terminal. Now, to run it, though, it's sudo package and upgrade. Well, there's actually sudo package update, I think, as well. Basically, kind of like apt. Okay, all the repositories are up to date, so now let's do an upgrade. And it says, do you want to uh, uh, uninstall the updates? We'll say yes. And now it's going to go ahead and check for the candidates. And it says 379 megabytes to be downloaded and the operation will free five megabytes. All right, so we'll go ahead and hit yes. And you'll see this is the very package it failed on. And you'll see it's downloading and we'll, we'll probably see the same result with this package is it's going to download it and there will probably be a size mismatch. Uh, I've been trying to update GhostBSD for two days now uh, through multiple different methodologies. So I'm pretty confident what we're going to see. So let's see what it does. So it did get past that one package on the download. It might fail at the test or we're going to see the other issue I was encountering a lot, which is where we'll get to the point where it just says stalled and then it'll fail out again. And there you can see it says stalled. So in my experience, when it says stalled like this, we will have to let it wait here for several minutes to see what it actually does. So while it's seeing if it actually updates, I'm going to go ahead and show you the software manager as well. Uh, kill two birds here with one stone. So under administration, we have the software station. And we do have to enter this. Ooh, this might conflict. I don't know if it will or not. All right, so we can keep note down there if that guy fails or stalls or whatever else. So now first what it's going to do is it's going to sync the software with the repository. This is going to show us all of the software available. Now this is something that's not too dissimilar from like a synaptic or uh, 
maybe something else. So we can see we have 34,000 packages here to deal with. Here's various desktop utilities. But we don't have any super easy way to filter out what's a, an application or what's just some dependency package. So that is one of the challenges. Now, if you know what you're looking for, you can type it in. Uh, in some cases, that's going to work well for you. In some cases, it won't. In this case, I typed in Thunderbird. See what we get. And you can see that we have Thunderbird. We have dictionaries for Thunderbird, and then we have some RoundCube plugins for Thunderbird. So, of course, RoundCube is a uh, PHP web-hosted uh, email client that you can install on a web server. And so that's kind of what we have. But I ran into problems trying to install something like LibreOffice because there's so many dependencies in here. What it's doing is it's giving us so many language packs and I can't sort by GUI packages or things like that as far as I could tell. Um, and so you can see it's giving us just language packs all the way down, but this is apparently the maximum number of results the thing will give us. So to actually find LibreOffice, I would actually have to come under editors in the sidebar. And now this is going to sort mostly by name. There's a few exceptions to that, but mostly by name. You can see here we're into the LibreOffice, but again, it's giving us all of the language packages for LibreOffice. And if I go to the very, very bottom of those language packages, this is actually the full integrated install for LibreOffice. So it is a little bit harder to find the software that you need. Searching just gave me overwhelming amounts of language packs without actually giving me the single piece of software I was looking for. So there are some issues there. However, if you do know what you're looking for, you can probably find it without uh, a huge, huge problem. Uh, there are a lot of packages in here, so looking for anything might actually, you know, it might result in something good. So here's a uh, FileZilla. I use that for work. Here's uh, Bluefish. So there's the Bluefish editor. I use that for work. Let's see if OBS Studio is in here. So here's OBS Studio. Here's OBS Studio plugin, uh, the Stream FX. Here's Recursion FX plugins. Here's Text um, P Thread, Waveform. So they have a lot of the software that I might need working uh, through this. So as far as replacing it, an operating system that can run our software packages, I think that overall you will find the things that you need inside of GhostBSD. Um, albeit it is a little bit more difficult. Linux, I think, becomes a little bit more polished in this respect with the GUI having a few more a few more tools and options available. You know, if you don't like the package manager, you can always install the GNOME Software Center or a few other options that you have. But they do have information. Now let's get back to our updates. I did actually notice if you guys caught it or not. Um, it After it stalled out, it did give us another package mismatch. Here it is right here. So you can see Python gave us a package mismatch from remote. Um, and so it is still looking to fetch more software. So we are, again, just going to go ahead and let it do its thing and see if we get to another error or another stoppage. And I want to get to the bottom and see if this actually updates around these mismatches or if it just fails out altogether. Now, we might have a case where here's another stall. Uh, we might have a case where in Pac-Man, Usually, if I get anything that stalls out or doesn't update, I just run the the updater again, and it will usually find whatever package it failed to upload um, or download from the repository in the past. And so I find that Pac-Man, even apt, do fix some of those issues. Uh, so far, I've been trying to get FreeBSD, or in this case, GhostBSD, updated now for a couple days, and it doesn't appear anything is installing after these stalls and after a single package uh, uh, fails out. So that's kind of the result that I keep on seeing. Uh, but we'll go ahead and uh, and wait and see what uh, what happens here. All right, so it has finished downloading. There were a couple other stall out packages and it went ahead and uh, finished out and kind of skipped those. Now I'm kind of seeing what's going to go on here with the extracting. So it does actually look like it is updating the system. Uh, the two packages that I noted that did not download, one of those was a Firefox package, although it looks like it downloaded the same package. So you can see 98 is the one that failed, 
but it you can see that it appears to be the exact same package did end up succeeding as package number 99. So I'm not sure what the case was with that. And of course, there was one other one there as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and see. So it is now extracting. You'll see that it is extracting and upgrading individual files. So uh, it appears to be working now, um, which is unlike the result that I got last time. So maybe it's possible that there was just some issue going on with the... Uh, with the update server yesterday, that is possible. I have encountered that. And if we have worked with Linux enough, that is the case. Let's see. Uh, see if there's anything else. Um, uh, FFmpeg thumbnail report currently does not have a maintainer result. It is more than likely unresolved issues, not up to date. Uh, so let's see if uh, there's any. Let's run the upgrade again and see if there's anything else. So it says checking zero, everything is done. So it actually did update itself correctly this time. I had to do that through the terminal, not updating it through the GUI updater. So how many times have we seen that, Linux folks, where the terminal is actually the solution? So um, overall, it looks like everything is working. Uh, am I ready to jump to... Uh, BSD in order to run this as a new system. Uh, I am not at this point in time. I think that Linux uh, has a few more things going for it for me because I'm not necessarily the, the nerd who wants to figure out how to get everything to work. I am the business guy that has things I need to accomplish. And for me, I'm going to stay as close to free and open source that I can, utilizing systems that I have full control over that allow me to get my work done with the minimal amount of outside interference. And for me, that's actually what Linux solves for me, where I have access to the software, I have a lot of GUI tools, I can occasionally get into the terminal if I need to. Overall, everything has works well for me. I can find the packages that I need. And more often than not, there's the support. I looked up this error I was having with the upgrader um, a while on the internet, and I was not able to find a lot of things. And that does carry with it that if you search up something on Linux, you can usually find an answer. It might be five years old, but it might also still work. Whereas on BSD, I was having issue finding answers to problems that I had. Now, overall, this is really good. And if you are looking to get into BSD, I would probably highly recommend you start with Ghost because it does have this GUI approach to it and it does have a good community surrounding it. And then this will give you the experience that you need to learn more about how BSD works. And uh, with that, it's going to give you all of the, the basic tools that you want. So hopefully this has been fun for you a look at ghost bsd i have never seen any bsd desktops before this was my first time hopefully it was as good for you as it was for me with that thanks for watching and i hope that you enjoy switching to linux thank you for watching this video from switched to linux this channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now you can be a supporter at patreon at patreon.com slash t-o-m-m or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.